Greetings, Mickey 104. This is a lecture about the Pew Matrix technique or process. It's a systematic technique devised by Stuart Pew um, to be used for concept generation selection. It's typically thought of as one where you are making selections of um, a, a set, identified set of potential ideas or concepts, but really it can also be used before any sort of final selection to generate new ideas from a provided set. So two inputs are needed minimally your engine requirements and the constraints that might come along with those, and a number of possible solutions to satisfy these requirements. In other words, ideas, uh, full-fledged concepts of, of things that might address your <clears throat> system, design, whatever it is that you're working on. And here's a scenario. In a typical design project, you would have worked together with your team to uh, identify customer needs, and from that, in consultation with uh, stakeholders and question and answer periods, you would have determined the engineering requirements, the engineering specifications from that, and again, your constraints. And that would have been done in a, in a scenario where you were keeping that as solution agnostic as possible. You have not yet determined solutions to it. You're trying to find out what this, the, the features and characteristics and uh, the, the specific quantitative requirements that that solution has to, to achieve. Then you would have moved on to things like a functional decomposition where you would determine the key functional elements of whatever the solution is. And again, you would have tried to have kept that as uh, agnostic of the solution as possible. So it would apply to whatever was eventually um, conceived of. From a functional decomposition, after identifying some of the key functions, you would have done some brainstorming to address ways to meet those functionalities. Then you would have done something like a morphological table where you identify and kind of group together according to those key functions uh, and other needs that are identified in there, uh, possible solutions to those. Picking amongst those different rows in the morphological table, uh, you could identify a number of concepts that could meet when they're combined in a general sense, um, your needs. At, this point though, moving into the Pew Matrix, the first time when you're really going to consider all of those possible uh, concept solutions against the specific engineering requirements. Up to this point, those things have been more or less separated from each other. Again, the requirements would have been developed. Those are things that have to be met no matter what the solution looks like. And your brainstorming and uh, the, the work with that and your functional decomposition, again, was something that was done no matter what the, the solution really looked like. Um, but now when you have concepts that you want to consider, you are considering them specifically, assessing them against the engine requirements, and now's the time to put all those things together. <clears throat> I'm going to show you an example. It's from uh, Stuart Pugh's article that you were uh, assigned to read as part of the course. I'm going to show you just at this point what the table looks like. This is in some ways not complete because as we'll mention later, the list of the concepts at the top, they're just numbered one through 14. In the full concept here, it wouldn't just be numbers up there. Those would be the sketches of the ideas, but as Pew points out, and, and I'm restricted by this as well, um, there's not room to do that. So they're just numbered and he does have sketches. I, there are sketches that go along with these numbered concepts. And I'll show you that later. But at this point, I just wanna give you uh, heads up on sort of what this would look like where you've got on the leftmost column all of these requirements um, that your system your design needs to eventually satisfy and then again there are, in this case 14 different concepts are identified in this uh, motor horn um, system that they were looking to design and you can see the table then consists of all of these pluses and minuses and s's it's just a very simplistic system for, for assessing each of these concepts individually against a chosen datum. And the idea of this, again, is it lets you look at all your concepts together uh, as objectively as possible, consider them against the datum as a way of doing a relative um, comparison and selection amongst them of what has the best concept, the best uh, features overall. So that's where we want to end up with. I'm going to talk first, though, about sort of the uh, rules, if you will, of how you would do that. So back into my presentation. So this technique's help, the technique helps to extend both the requirements and the solution. So you will begin with a set of requirements when you do this, but you might discover through the process that you need to add some. If, and for instance, the, the one way you might discover that is if you don't have enough requirements there to make a very um, 
clear distinction or differentiation between the different existing ideas that you've got. Um, but more important than that, extending the solutions by just the process of, of doing this um, assessment, you might think of ways to combine the existing ideas. You might uh, even think of entirely new ones just by the discussion process that you have. So in that sense, again, this is not just a a single sort of iteration where you put in a, a finite set of these choices and out comes a magic one at the end. More often than not, if this is working properly, it will have multiple iterations where you come up with intermediate ideas and then reassess. So go back through the process again and again. And this is this concept of, uh, or this idea of concept convergence. Uh, you may actually diverge a little bit at first as you widen the solution set, the possible solution set, and then narrow it down again and kind of back and forth a little bit as you're sort of like a funnel looking shape if you could if you could graph this out somehow. But eventually your goal is to find what is the best concept out of all of those to move forward into the full design. So that's the full idea of the Pew Matrix technique concept generation and ultimate selection. It is an iterative process though when practiced properly. It is also a, a, a team-based project. The whole idea is that you're going to be communicating with the rest of your design team and through a group discussion uh, by careful consideration and objective reasoning assess all of these individual ideas against each other. Um, so it is not meant to be a solitary exercise. It's uh, therefore, it's not driven by a single person with the loudest or persons with the loudest voices or gut feelings. There has to be a rationalization of why these decisions are made. And in that sense, the idea is again, you're sort of crowdsourcing a better solution to everything. The crowd being your full design team. So here are the steps in this. <clears throat> Number one, List your requirements. We list. We, we said that was one of the things you would start with here, and that sh is already done. I should point out, at least in Mechie 104, a lot of these are given to you, at least the specific ones, um, because we tell you the nature of your design project. So we are already giving you um, a, a number of engineering requirements already, but you will possibly, almost certainly, come up with some other ones in the, in the consideration of what you need to do, thinking about what your project requirements are. Uh, you'll probably come with some other ones as well and some constraints and things like that that would go into it but use short simple statements that you can you can easily see uh, and they've short so the sense that they fit on this in this matrix you may recall from the picture i showed you that the leftmost column has all these requirements there so they can't be long um, drawn out descriptions they have to be somehow listed in short simple statements if you think about the way the, the functions are written originally, those would be in verb noun pairs. So that may be a possible way to do this. Make sure they're measurable so that everyone has a grasp of what they're supposed to be. And then therefore, especially the more quantitative they are, the better. Write the definitions down so they're clearly defined without ambiguity. So even if your statements that appear in the matrix need some additional description, that's somewhere written. So if someone needs to kind of refresh their memory, or at least when they come into the process, know what all these are, someone on your team, they can do that. And if it's not clear, indicate which direction the, uh, the desired trait would go. So for instance, if you just say weight is uh, one of your requirements, well, is it better to be a higher weight or a lower weight? Which direction would be uh, give you the plus versus the minus? That's not always clear if you're not careful how you list that. Then you discuss these ideas. You would sketch and describe each concept. So that's, again, here where we circle back around to having the, the skills to do that, to communicate what it is that you have as a concept. Um, you're working in a team, remember, and if there's a number of ideas up there, it may be that some of you are, are individual sort of champions of them. So maybe you came up with it. Hopefully you're not uh, so driven that that's your, your only single mindset. But... Um, it may be that there are individual people championing certain ideas there that you want to make sure is clear what your what your concept is. Make sure everyone understands. Then your sketch, as detailed as possible, but not being overwhelming, so that it's, it can fit up at the top of your matrix and convey the idea as you're having these discussions without having to again go into to long descriptions. You do not want these. Uh, long descriptive statements again at the top of the table it should be something that's easily visible and understandable <clears throat> by a sketch ideally do all of these to a similar standard and level of detail so you don't have an unconscious bias given to one over another try to improve on these concepts that can trigger new ideas just the process of putting them all up there and talking about them may in and of itself 
trigger some new ideas. And again, that's back to this notion of this Pew Matrix technique or process being not just about selection, but also concept generation. And sometimes you can group similar concepts together, but that does mean at the beginning, you're better off trying to make sure there are some meaningful or significant differences between these. Uh, and if you think about it, that makes sense. If all of your concepts are only minor differences between them, then that will be difficult to differentiate between them as well. Um, so you, there should be a good variety of different uh, options on the, on the features and characteristics. Prepare this matrix. Your requirements go on the leftmost column. The uh, sketches, your concept ideas go on the very top row for the, the headers, if you will, of the columns. Um, and you can use letters and numbers there, but again, try not to make it words that are doing this. You want something that's easily visual, and that's how a lot of engineers just naturally think in the first place is very visually. Leave some space for new additions as discussions progress. And uh, you might recall from Stuart Pugh's article that uh, he, he reflected on a number of these realistic scenarios where they often had these, these uh, matrices, if they were done on a whiteboard so that they're more interactive, they might spread over multiple whiteboards. They might take one or more days to do some of these processes, again, because of the iterative nature and because of the back and forth of the, of the process. Select the datum for your initial comparisons, and then, of course, you'll be doing a datum every time that you do your, your process here. So all the other concepts are compared against the single datum. If you're comparing against an existing product or concept, use that as your datum to start. If it's something completely new, there is no existing product, then try to use one of them that has the widest, clearest coverage of the requirements. That may take some discussion to determine that. Um, but the reason you want to do that is so that it is it does have a representation. Your datum has a representation in all the requirement fields um, so that you can clearly talk about all of the other concepts against it. You want to make sure it's pretty well defined in those in all of those requirements. Then you compare the ideas. So one by one, working from left to right, consider each of the concepts against the datum. And by group discussion here, decide if each is better than, in which case you put a plus in the cell that lines up to that uh, to that criterion um, under the concept worse than, in which case you put a minus, or if it's the same, and again, this is all by uh, a group discussion and however that is, it, you determine that by a vote or whatever, um, hopefully by some sort of a consensus agreement, you would put an S in there. So it's a plus minus or S rating system. And note, it doesn't matter how much better or how much worse. There's not multiple pluses or minuses, and we can talk about that later as a uh, there's some variability in how this is practiced, but at least in, in Pew's original concept, it's just simply better than or worse than or the same. The degree of that is not considered at this point. When you're done filling out the table of the comparisons at the bottom of each column, you'll add the pluses, you'll add the minuses, and you'll also add up all the S's. And you leave them in those forms. So the goal is not to cancel them out and come up with a single magic number. So you don't say, well, I've got five pluses and three minuses. So overall, that's a two. You leave them spelled out as the number of pluses, the number of minuses, the number of S's. As you might imagine here, though, the stronger concepts will have the most pluses, but they have minuses too. And that's the reason why you leave things separate like that. You can still see visually the arrangement in the table of all these things. You can, you can line up what were the negatives, even though it has the most positives, a particular concept has the most positives. Well, what were the detriments of that? What were the negatives? In what ways um, was it not as good as the datum or even compared to other concepts across that same row? So tally the scores, but don't simply generate a final score. You want to use those tallies to critically evaluate the distributions of those scores. Step number seven, generate further ideas. These are uh, three quotes, that's why they're italicized. You can see a link at the bottom of this slide from a, 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 a company called Value Driven Design. It's a UK company. There's a link to this also in the My Courses site. It's a very good uh, description of the process, the, the Pew Matrix process that follows pretty closely to Stuart Pugh's original concept. And so I like the way these were worded here. So the strong solutions are the ones that have the, the, well, outright the most pluses and probably minimal or not overwhelming number of minuses. But here's how you could use these results to, to generate new ideas. So look along those strong solutions where they have minus signs. See if the other pro proposed solutions have 
plus signs. Um, could you combine some of those together? So in other words, replace the, the minus with a plus by, by borrowing that particular feature like you, 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 know, you could have seen on your uh, morphological table. Look for patterns that are emerging. Solutions that have lots of minuses, there's something that could be done about that. Um, just considering across the whole table, are there ways you can just generally combine things that have pluses to come up with another new concept altogether? So that's the kind of thing you can do. Have, again, more of these conversations. Then you rerun the evaluation. That's step number eight. Uh, use one of the modified solutions as, as the datum, if you've come up with those, and, and hopefully you have. You might find that none of the solutions is better than another. Could be because your criteria are ambiguous. Could be because you don't have enough of those requirements and criteria shown. That would be one thing where you then discover, well, maybe you need to think of more of those, or maybe split some of them up, or be more detailed in some of them. Maybe it's because some of the concepts are really the same, and this is why you would, at the beginning, try to make sure there are significant or at least meaningful differences between at least some of them. Uh, if that's not the case, you could rerun the analysis using another datum. If two st solutions have close scores, then use one of them as a datum and compare them uh, to the rest. And if all else is, is otherwise the same, you could still rerun the evaluation, even if your concepts haven't changed. It's still a good idea to do that by changing your datum. And here's the reason for that. Remember, when you put the pluses and minuses in there, you're not saying how much better a solution is, just that it is better. So you might have a couple solutions that come out to be pretty identical in their pluses and minuses, when in fact, on some of the rows, one of those solutions may have been significantly better. But remember, we don't indicate that here. But if you choose a different datum, and it maybe it happens to be in between those two, then you would see a differentiation. The one that was significantly better would still be better, but maybe the other one is now a negative, and then it starts to show a differentiation. So even if nothing else, even if you don't have new uh, concepts that come up, it's good to rerun this process a couple of times by shifting the datum, and it will make sure that you really have settled on the one that is the, the best combination of all these features. Again, it's an iterative technique will eventually lead to a concept convergence where you can pick the one that truly is uh, the best of those. Let me go back to um, this example from Pew. So this is uh, out of Stuart Pew's article. These were the 14 concepts that were identified in his example. Number one is a traditional car horn. And remember, this was a device that would signal people of the, it's a, I think it was an enunciator, they called it. Um, didn't originally use the name horn, a car horn, to describe what they were looking for, the system they were trying to design, because they didn't want to bias you into thinking it had to be a horn. It just had to be something that essentially made a noise. So these sketches are, are perfect for the concept here. They're fairly simple. They show what the individual elements are and give you an idea of how they work, but they're, they're not too detailed to see. Um, if they, even if they were shrunk down a little bit and stuck at the top of a table, um, and they're, they're not complex, not overly complex, there's not a lot of words in there. The point is at a glance you could identify what these are. They're numbered 1 through 14, and then here is the table that was used with those. Now again, it would be best if instead of just putting the numbers 1 through 14 at the top, you could actually put the sketches up there. There wasn't room to do that in the text that this was printed in. And so that's why they're separated, but that is not the way it's supposed to be. You would want to make, if you could, more room and put the sketches right up at the top where they're numbered 1 through 14 instead. But you can see the overall shape of this here, the idea, the leftmost column are all the requirements. They are pretty well worded. Ease of achieving, 105 to 125 decibels is the first one. Again, implying that you want that to be easy. The very first column includes the datum, which is the existing product, the existing car horn, everything else. So in the first row, it's the, the rest, the remaining 13 concepts compared against the, the, the original, the, the existing car horn for ease of achieving this loudness of it. Ease of achieving this certain frequency, and so on as you go down here. Response time. It doesn't say, I guess we're, we're meant to uh, assume that we want something that responds fast. The faster it responds, the better. Uh, and so on all the way down here, you can see that. And then at the very bottom, there's the tallies. So the sum of the pluses, the sum of the minuses, and the sum of the S's. 
it's pointed out that the fifth solution, and I don't know why here, I, I, I don't know the reason why um, solution number or concept number four was not evaluated. I'm not sure why that was left in there then, but in any event, uh, number five, as it turns out, is identified as the best choice. It has eight pluses overall, which actually is quite a bit more than any of the other ones. Uh, the next closest is five. It only has one minus, which is significantly less than any of the other ones and seven uh, instances where it's the same as the existing. So of all of these, number five is uh, identified as the best. Now, to be fair, we don't know what step of the process this table's been provided. We don't know if this was after multiple iterations that get here. I assume it was, but I don't know. Um, or if this really is the end, if there's something that could even be done beyond this here. But at least as far as I know at this point, if we stopped right here, number five would be the best choice. Let me go back. So some notes on this. So as I said, sketches should be included in the column headings, not the super detailed descriptions. Make sure everyone is clear what the concepts entail. So it's just a little a snippet of those. If you search online for references or, or, or examples of Pew Matrix process, um, quite a few of those will show tallied numerical results at the bottom, um, or might, so again, might come up with just a single final number at the end and say, well, this one's the, the, the highest number, so therefore it wins, quote unquote. And it is very common to see numerical weighting, weighting schemes for the requirements. So um, they will actually go through and say which requirements are more important than others, and then actually perhaps boost the, uh, the, the importance or the weighting or the, the tally of the pluses, for instance. So that you have a, a particular requirement that has a weight of three, then if you put a plus in that column, then you say, well, that actually equates to three pluses. Then none of that is a part of Stuart Pugh's original notion of how this should be done. And I like this quote again from the Value Driven Design website. A weighted rating matrix is not appropriate. At the concept stage, which is where you would use this matrix, there's an open field of design choices, meaning all of these different uh, functions and requirements and so forth that you're rating, you're still completely free to choose amongst, right? You can still combine things as you like to come up with new concepts. It's not like a customer weighing product offerings with fixed features. In other words, the only reason it would really matter where you have to go in and weight the features is if you can't change them. If you had to make a decision right then and there to pick things and you wanted to make sure you got exactly what you wanted, but that's not what's happening here. You can still change things around. You can still conceive of new concepts and make modifications to pick amongst all these. So we really just want to know what's better, what's worse, so we know how to proceed from that in terms of what to keep and what not to keep. We're not stuck with any of it. So it's really, you don't need to know at that point if something is much better. And also that sort of leads a little bit to, to uh, making a little bit of an assumption of exactly how something's gonna come out in the end. And you really aren't there yet. You're still in a conceptual design stage. You don't have final designs. So even though we're getting closer to tying things specifically together between requirements and designs, we still don't have a full-fledged complete design that's been completely um, built for that matter. And also, he does recommend, Stuart uh, Pugh recommended sticking to the plus minus and S rating scheme. If you put numbers there, first of all, if you put numbers that are, you could do like a minus one, a zero, and a one uh, to replace the, the negative um, S and plus. Um, but there's something about seeing the numbers that, as it says here, are almost regarded as unquestionable. It seems like it's a, it's a trivial difference, but something between the pluses and minuses and the S's, it still gives more of a sort of a, a visual take as you, as you look at this to, to bring things together. And remember, engineers are very visual in that sense. So even though that seems a small difference, it's best to keep it that way. And then as it says here, this rating from one to five or those types of schemes, that's no different than using a weighting scheme. And in this case, it still requires, so if you, if you used a weighting scheme, you'd at least be talking about just a single smaller set of requirements. If you use a, a rating factor, say a one through five, you'd be doing that on every single criterion of every single 
concept, so that would be even more work to do, more discussion, and you'd be quibbling over things about, well, what is a three versus a four? So even more need to kind of well-define things. It distracts from the process, the idea of the process in the first place, that you're just looking for relative comparisons. The degree of that doesn't matter. So again, stick to this original rating scheme. And Stuart uh, Pugh originally came around to the, to the notion that including costs as a requirement was a mistake. If you go back and look at the example I showed you that was in his article, he did have cost in there, manufacturing cost. But he came around to understanding that that's probably not a good thing to do because at this stage, you don't know cost. And actually, you can't really know the cost at all until you have a really full-fledged design. You don't know exactly what's going to be made out of. You don't know how hard it's going to be to make it unless you know exactly what it is. And that's the point, you don't know that. And again, from the value-driven design site here, I like this quote as well. It's value for money which matters. What you're getting for the cost, not the cost alone. Sounds a little like a marketing pitch, but part of the idea is if you really do find a, a much better idea, then you try to work to the way that if you need to, you can make it cheaper, or maybe it turns out that it's worth that it costs more. That may very well be the case as well. That's not really an engineering requirement yet at this point. So as a summary, uh, it is not a one-shot process. The Pew Matrix technique is meant to be done in a team uh, approach. Ultimately, it will help you determine what is the best solution available for you to continue pursuing. The process also can highlight the strengths of that preferred solution naturally because of the conversations you're having gives a better team ownership of the final solution because you're all talking about that. You're all weighing your opinions and at the end, hopefully coming to consensus opinions. So everyone feels like they've got a, a ownership of that. And it uh, downplays the ability of any one particular person to drive the process to their own uh, opinion. Uh, also interesting, the degree of risk on the chosen concept can be assessed because you've already been talking through it. And if you think about it, at least minimally, the, the sort of risks you have are those areas where there are minuses that, that, that might exist in your final selection. Those are things that are have, for one degree or another, given up something compared to existing solutions. And in that sense, that's a risk, right? Because there, you'll have to take something away from what exists in return for the other things you're going to give that are better. But that is a risk that's there, among other things. And another very important thing is because of the process, because there's a methodical process behind it with conversation, especially if you keep track of notes and there's some sort of a recording that happens here, uh, recording of the information, not necessarily a, a literal recording, but uh, the process here that you follow by an objective method here, you've got a traceability through the matrix, especially if you write this all this, these things down, you can indicate how you arrive through the, the sort of the progression of this matrix at your decisions and why things were done. That traceability is always uh, very beneficial. So thanks for listening.